Welcome to the show, Laura. I'm happy to be here and it's good to see you again. Good to see you again. So funny to be doing this, also being streaming it on LinkedIn events, super meta. Yeah, no, it, it, it's a perfect home uh, for the conversation. <laughs> So for anybody to, to, who's listening, Laura is a senior director of product at LinkedIn. Uh, before, she ran product at Netflix, Warner Bros, and other companies like Glue and Electronic Arts. Um, maybe, Laura, you can start by sharing a little bit more about your background. Um, sure. Uh, so my, I'll tell a quick story. Uh, my humble beginning started in the Bay Area, uh, uh, you know, born and raised in um, the, the Bay Area, which then led me to want to dive into uh, computer science and electrical engineering. Uh, and my journey has been more like a jungle gym. Um, if you think about the park and all the different experiences you can have versus more like, a, I would say the the contrast would be like a ladder. And so in this park or this jungle gym, you know, I've spent time in consulting, which is like the jump pads. I've you know, spent time in video games, which is more like the swing where you're going up and down. I, you know, I've spent time in media and TV film, which is more like a slide. And uh, each of these experiences have helped me build uh, my toolkit of product leadership and product thinking uh, and intuition, which uh, now I bring to uh, LinkedIn. And what is it that you do at LinkedIn now? So uh, as you, you, you highlighted, I'm the Senior Director of Product Management. I oversee and lead our profile, messenger, and groups teams. Uh, these are three, three different types of products uh, within LinkedIn. Um, and, and really everything from establishing the vision for the, each of those experiences to uh, you know, supporting each of the teams um, as they're launching uh, new feature sets um, and working with cross-functionally across all of our leaders. So I see two themes. I like your analogy around the, the playground. Like two of the themes that I see is your experience in media with Warner Bros and Netflix and also your experience in gaming at Electronic Arts and Glue. I'm curious to know how the, those experiences in media and gaming shaped how you go about building product today. Yeah, so uh, very early on, I have had a passion to build products in the uh, the tech space, and then specifically was around entertainment consumer experiences. Um, and my experience of of being exposed to different types of products, um, what it did was it gave me the intuition around. Um, what works in one industry or for one type of product could potentially work for another. And a lot of times, like when you go, um, what I felt is like I, I had an appetite to be a lot more curious. Uh, and so when you're building products and you have an appetite to be curious, to challenge the status quo, to never assume that you're done or that the product's done, it allows you to have that growth mindset. Um, it, which is, you know, led me how these experiences have led me to my product thinking today. So let's, I, I'm just curious if there is something specific. So for example, in, in the entertainment space, I, I know that you actually work with Lady Gaga in some capacity. Tell me more um, about that. Well, uh, there's a plaque on my, behind me. Uh, with the music <laughs> plaque. Um, that was very early on in my career. Uh, so as a founder of a company called Avid Exposure, we were early days media advertisement working on web browser ads. Um, think about like before brow like ad blockers and before Chrome. Like these are very early, probably everybody was on like Internet Explorer back then. Uh, and so we we're early days ad tech, um, and that experience taught me how to uh, build creatives. And then also the technology stack and how like those two things intertwine. Now, later on, um, I, the, the company led me to take an offer with a small company at the time uh, called Tapjoy, uh, since then has been sold. Uh, but Tapjoy was a very, um, what I learned in that transition was, here's how you build ads for uh, web browsers. And that led me to the next experience, which was here's how you build ads for mobile devices on games. And again, like 
taking my experience up from one part of the playground to the next, I was able to build on that. And so like, then I learned mobile, which was a very new platform at that time. And so I asked myself, well, what can I bring to mobile? And I was able to launch like video products on mobile. And then that led me to video games. And um, my experience in video games, for those who are interested in that space, is that games have a life cycle that are roughly around like a year and a half to two years. So you're shipping, you know, constantly in the video game space, especially with di digital releases. And so each um, learning how to, to release products in a much uh, frequent case uh, cadence was something that I had to then take with me when I went from um, video games to Netflix, where Netflix uh, was all about um, you know, moving fast and, and constantly like reinventing yourself and innovating. And so a lot of these experiences build on top of each other. And I was able to add value immediately from my prior experience. And I, I thank you for expanding on that. I think that's very cool and interesting for, for people as, as they navigate their careers. I, I've seen the approach of product people going super deep in a specific industry and like be, become the ultimate expert at that. And I've also seen a different approach, which is similar to what you're describing, which is like taking learnings from different industries and, and finding ways to apply them into the next one while still having space to pretty much start from scratch, you know, and, and, and embrace that uncertainty. Absolutely. Um, that I feel like it's almost been become a core skill of mine. Um, and, and that's the, the curiosity that I have uh, in this toolkit and the way I look at it as like through that playground experience, I now have all these tools. And so I'm always curious, hmm, I wonder which one of these tools I can apply to this new space. And uh, what I found is you can apply a lot of them uh, because there are, there are several principled thinking approaches that are applicable to multiple industries. Well, let's talk about the new, the new toy in the playground. So LinkedIn specifically, and LinkedIn Profile is one of the products that you, you lead. Uh, it's been around for a long time. I think it's around 20 years. So I'd be curious to know when, so what was the status of that product by the time that you joined and how it has evolved over time up until now? Um, yeah, the, so um, maybe I should give some just quick context. Uh, I came from entertainment, like majority of my experience has been in the media, like you said, media and entertainment space. And so switching to social network uh, was a huge, you want to talk about like playground. It was like all of a sudden I ended up in like the splash pad or like a water park of the, the playground, um, just really foreign. And, and uh, social networks was a new technical structure for me to have to learn and onboard to. So um, when I first started almost two years ago, uh, LinkedIn uh, had, um, I would say the product was, it was in a, um, it was still moving forward, but more of like a holding pattern. It was, you know, really, it hadn't, LinkedIn profile had not changed that much. Uh, and changes on profiles very uh, difficult at times because it, what people may not know is that profile impacts many aspects of LinkedIn. Um, your profile data is uh, what represents you throughout the ecosystem. And so when I came then to not answer the latter part of your question, like what's changed, um, several experiences we've introduced since um, I've joined the team. Uh, one is that the biggest one is that we launched verifications. And so the journey of launching um, your verified identity was a very um, crafted one to make sure that it felt authentic to each of our, our members and to make sure that um, it wasn't something that you could just buy and like buy your, your, your identity. It was truly, you know, innate with who you are. So that was one area. Let me give you kudos to that, first of all, because it's, it's huge and it's all, you made it free and available to everyone, which is very different than the approach I've seen in, in other social networks where you have to pay to play in order to have that verification badge. Yeah, it, you know, it's funny you, call, you talk about the badge, like um, my experience in this this uh, launch was really around like, what should it be? Should it be a badge? Should it be, you know, something else? Should it be a check mark? Should I mean, you, the number of product thinking questions on what's the representation to each member um, was a lot more detailed than it may seem. Now, granted, it came off well, and everybody has 
Um, you know, there was a lot of positive feedback from our consumers around verifications, but uh, you know, hopefully everybody listening in when I like that was a journey to get there uh, in the product thinking and the product design and making sure that the representation of the symbol like truly meant um, like what we had intended for the strategy. Um, the other there's a few other areas that uh, we launched. The, the second one that I've been uh, I, I've been fortunate to be part of was a lot of our AI assisted tools. Uh, so we launched a, a feature where it's AI assisted writing for your uh, summary. Uh, and this was really to help with the cold start problem. Um, if you're early in your journey, or just maybe this is the first time you're, you're updating your profile and you get to the section, which is like a, really about you. And now you have this free form text box that you need to, to write up a summary about yourself that can be very daunting to the average member. And so we wanted to find a delightful way to allow members to be able to enhance their profile and, and do it through AI. And, and so you can now leverage that feature um, through premium uh, subscription and it will help um, pull things out of your profile and write a summary about you uh, that you can then post on to your profile. So let's talk about those success metrics. Yeah, you're part of a massive platform. Obviously, Profiles is a very important product. Um, what are some of the success metrics that you obsess about? Um, it, well, I won't be able to go into all details, but I could talk about like my own point of view of like how I frame uh, success metrics and your North Star. Uh, so the first thing is understanding like, what are you optimizing for? Are you optimizing for engagement or are you optimizing for um, monetization? Are you optimizing for retention? So like in product, there's these key success metrics that are like core to any product. Um, for me, when I look at a product, I like to start with um, what are the things that, you know, causes members to engage with the product. So it doesn't matter if your product's monetary or not. I think it's important to start with engagement because if members aren't, if consumers aren't engaging with your product or any of your customers aren't engaging with your product, then trying to monetize it, trying to have retention, like all of the other types of success metrics become harder in my playbook. Um, I know there's different philosophies to this approach with different product leaders, but I'd say the preference I like to take is always starting with engagement first. Like why do customers love your product? And that's like a first principle thinking approach that I, I always encourage my teams to start with. Um, and so even with uh, the profile product, that's the first type of question I ask, which is like, what causes you to want to come back and update your profile? Because once it's set, you might have like a set it and forget it. And so how do we encourage you to want to make sure it stays fresh? Want you, we encourage you to want to um, maintain your profile, to be current, add new information to it, etc. Yeah, I'm asking, I want to ask you that question. Why? You know, because especially like obviously back in the day when we were looking at this as a static page, people would tend to update it when they are in the market, right? When they're looking for another job. But like if you are not looking for a job, why would I want to update my profile constantly? Yeah, it, you know, it's the, uh, the way to interpret it is, um, think about networking. So like when you're networking um, and you're introducing yourself and you're meeting new people, and I know Carlos, you, you meet new product leaders all the time. Uh, when you talk about what you do or you know, what you're working on, um, you know, normally you'll want to talk about what's recent, what's relevant, um, you know, things that may re be relevant to that conversation. And that's the same if you were to use that analogy to like your profile, we want to make sure that you're having that same conversation uh, relevancy on your profile. So if your profile is static, outdated, you know, the last time you were searching for a job was 10 years ago, and that's what's represented on your profile. Then again, like that introduction or that conversation, you're really talking about 10 year old things. And so what we want you to do is bring that move that uh, relevance forward and actually have it be fresh and represented of, you know, things that you've done in the last month or even the last year. Yeah, and obviously, I'm a content creator these days. Uh, 
I'm not very proud of that term. I, I will hope there was a better one, but you know, I consider myself an entrepreneur that happens to be building products. And I think it, I, I recognize the value of getting out there, creating good content, adding value. And obviously LinkedIn is, is part of my life. Like I use it multiple times a day. I can imagine that there's a strong connection between the profile product with newsfeed or other features, events, recruiter. So I'd be curious to know, like, how do you go about partnering with different product leaders to ensure that your benefit, let's say if you're pushing a specific uh, metric, is actually helping others and not kind of going against other metrics? Absolutely. Um, That was actually a a different approach I had to learn in a network uh, style company versus like a content company like a Netflix. Um, When you are in a network, everything's connected, right? So the social graph connects a lot of these experiences. And, and so what you do in one product could essentially impact another. Um, the way I approach it is making sure uh, not just your cross-functional partners, but your um, the dis- different business units are aware of major changes. Um, and what I've had to do as the, the profile leader is essentially learn almost every experience in LinkedIn. Uh, I think my role has been unique uh, because you know, profile does impact almost every experience on LinkedIn. And so I have to understand, okay, if I'm, if our team goes down this strategy, you know, it's, is it going to impact jobs or is it going to impact the feed or is it going to impact messaging groups, my own products? And so in order to, to understand what kind of impact is potentially, um, you know, that potentially we might have to mitigate or we might have to encourage like I have to understand those those parts of the ecosystem. And so, uh, you know, very, very different, I'd say from my media and content experiences where the experience is a little bit more isolated, like this one, um, you do have to look at all of the incremental impact uh, with every decision. Yeah, I always find that fascinating at a, at a larger scale. I mean, one of the other changes that I remember from profile is this content creator profile, right? Like. If, if you consider yourself content creator, there's a specific real estate within your profile that is featuring the type of post that you create on your newsfeed and other things that, or other things that you, can, you can feature. So I can imagine there's like a very strong correlation between newsfeed product and, and profile in addition to obviously others that you describe. Yeah, I, I can't tell you like how they're, they're, um, how they're connected uh, from a data perspective, but what I can say is when you go to your profile, um, it's important to showcase w- the type of content activity you do. And so if you were to go there, like we showcase your posts, your comments, the images, the articles, and, you know, because that's representative, like you were mentioning earlier, you're a content creator, that's representative of your voice. And so we want to make sure, and your voice is part of your identity. And so we want to make sure that that shows up well uh, on your profile. And this is the geek in me. I use LinkedIn for different things, including recruiting. Uh, for for my company, <clears throat> I also when I, when I look at people's profile. But first of all, I go to their profiles even before I go to the resume. Sometimes I don't even go to the resumes. But when I'm at their profile, I don't stop there. I look at their activity, and it's not just about what they post, but I also want to see the reactions, like who they follow, what do they like, and that tells me more about who they are. Yeah, absolutely. Um, And this is not unique to just LinkedIn, but like a lot of social companies, uh, when you look at like what we call social, what I call social proofing. uh, So what you're doing is an activity of social proofing. Uh, You're validating or you're 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 um, evaluating another person based on their social connection and the response from their social connections. And that is very common among uh, social products, uh, things like, you know, how many accounts you have, whether it's how many uh, reposts or how many reactions you have or how many um, comments you have. That's a very common um, experiential uh, thing that people look for. It, it, and I wouldn't say that's unique to any of the social apps. Good. I feel validated. And here is a hot take. I sometimes when I see that someone is posting too much or, or or like it's all for the cloud, I actually start doubting how good they can be. So yeah, I don't know if it's a hard rule to know like what's the right balance between content and, and, and whatnot, but I don't 
evaluate this just based on you know how many connections you have, how many people follow you, and how popular you are. It's more about like what are you into. Uh, yeah, you know, the way I would interpret this question is like when you think about social networks um, and like why are you talking on the social network is like a really important question for any content creator or any um, anybody who's like um, engaging in public content. Uh, and that's the same question that every reader or every you know listener is also asking, like, why are you talking? What are you saying? And so there are people out there across the networks that will post just randomly and almost anything. And I, I think that what that does is it dilutes the content that you're presenting. And so um, if you're if you're not tailored to your content, you may lose some of your audiences, which, you know, I, I don't know how many of you listening have like, posted like a photo, you know, on a, a social network app and like some, like a lot of people didn't react to it. And then, you know, another time you, you, you have like this varying range of reactions depending on the content. Um, the, the, my advice would be the more you could tailor your content to like what you're trying to say, what you stand for, what's important to you, the better and more honed in on like, you know, the people that will react to it and, and engage in those conversations will be. That's another interesting point. I, I've seen a, the, the, the content formats evolve from just yes, pure text to multimodal. Uh, these days, especially like short video is, is huge. And I know that LinkedIn is, pu is pushing that as well. So curious to know, like for people who are not content creators, but I I in general, like what's your take on, on this type of new formats that might require some skills or work to actually put together a nice, a nice piece? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I say this having been in content a long time and seeing many forms of content. Um, my advice for content creators is that, you know, you'll want to like think about your content and then which format resonates best uh, and then let that be your primary. Um, th that's like, I'd say rule one. And then rule two is like after you've achieved your primary format, look to convert to the other format so that you get more breadth. So you you spend your depth in rule one, which is like what format resonates best with what kind of content you have. And then rule number two is like get your breath across all the different formats. The reason why that, that one, two approach is important is when people just start off like in the breath phase where they're just trying to get their content on every single platform, it may not always resonate or it may not show up well or the content may not be cut um, for that. And it, it again, this is my take. My take is that you start with one platform that you um, do well in first, and then you scale from there. And then that will help you start to build content specifically for the different formats. Because um, I can tell you, like audio formats, very different from video. Video is very different from short form. Short form is very different from like clips. And like, so there, even when I was at Netflix, I mean, you had featured content and television series, like those were very different formats. And then you had shorts and now live. So the same thing I think applies for like social networks is like each of these formats have different types of influences to your audience. And it's so interesting how all of these platforms are kind of converging in a way as they expand, right? Netflix has video games. LinkedIn has video games. The New York Times has video games. So how do you see now the conversion of all of these different angles? It's a you know interesting question, uh, especially from games having been in like core gaming and then seeing these platforms who are um, you know do I would say elements of games. I wouldn't say they're necessarily like core gaming platforms. Um, I, what this all boils down to, we talked about metrics earlier, and I think this boils down to like one metric in my book uh, professionally, which is like time spent in the app. And, you know, anytime you introduce a new a new experience or a new format, what you're what I think ultimately these companies are trying to do is increase time spent in an app. So that way members, you know, or users or your customers will want to engage with that app more. And, and games is traditionally like having spent time at Electronic Arts, uh, spending time at Glue and Warner Brothers. Um, games is a retention 
product. Like if you have a really good game, their retention curve on a game is a very long tail, um, very different from other styles of tech. And so if you you can get mem- um, users to engage with the game, they'll chances are they'll play with that game daily and play with it for a long time. I mean, think about how many people are still playing with Candy Crush and Candy Crush came out a long time ago, right? So it, it, it's a great retention experience. Um, and so I think that's why, you know, Amazon, Google, like you name every big tech company has tried to go into games. It's because they're looking for that time spent in their their experience. Yeah, and, and I'm also thinking about now the recipes, right? New York Times is huge on the recipes, like different ways for people to get value and spend time on the platform as a whole. Yeah, and there's like a running joke because every time I go to a company like that's not a gaming company and I go there, like games appears and I swear it has like it. It's not me being <laughs> intentional, but like when I went to Netflix and then Netflix went into games. And then when I went into LinkedIn, then LinkedIn went into games. Um, and it was funny because I I love games like video games and content is like very near and dear to my heart. Um, I just wanted to broaden my experiences again, like always on the playground. And so I went into social network, but games seems to be following me <laughs> wherever I go. Yeah. <laughs> well, Laura, I, I want to switch gears a little bit. I, I, I actually love your motto that says "Big products like you, just like the world depends on it, because it does. Um, so I would love to learn more about how you actually go about building products, very specific framework. Yeah, um, you know, build products like the world depends on it because like it, it does. Like it is very, you know, I think in product building, um, there were moments in my experience where um, it, it, things can be felt mundane, frustrating, and you know, just for all the product builders out there where you're like, just in like a slug where you're just tired of building. And, and you know, hopefully that my motto like inspires you to remember that even during the hard times of product building, like you're building something that a consumer, a customer, will one day like depend on it. And like having that inspiration continues to carry you forward to build really great products. So that's the high level narrative, um, like digging into it. I, I, you know, I have a question that I always ask, which is the, so what question you build this thing. So what, and if you can't answer the, so what question, I feel like I'm a very principled pr- product leader. Uh, you know, if you can't answer that, so what, like my next question is why are we building this? <laughs> right. And it, they're just very simple questions. Like you're building this. So what, Who, like, who's going to care about it? Who's going to depend on this product? And if you can't really think about who's going to depend, the dependency is like a very specific word. Like, you know, they need that product. They love it. It's like part of their daily routine. If, if people don't depend on that product, then it's staying power in the future will be very limited. And so then you have to ask your question. The next question is like, why are we even building this to begin with? And so that's where that motto came from, from the kind of strategic thinking is, you know, when you build products like the world of depends on it, which is that you answered the so what, you know, it, then it, the world does depend on it, which then leads to that outcome that it will have staying power and it will outlast its competitors and be there to solve problems for its consumers or customers. When you're building for millions of users, like it's been the case uh, throughout your career, how do you think through the different customer motivations? So there might be cases where someone, someone's life would depend on that certain feature, but maybe it's a different segment of your customer base that doesn't really care at all. Yeah, um, this one is a difficult one. And I, I remember during our product school conference when um, I, was, I came to speak at the conference, um, I talked about a, like a product design approach to having a diverse set of customer motivations. Um, Let me start with like what I've traditionally seen over the years in product. And this is like well over 20 years. Uh, What product uh, thinkers will do is they'll start with one customer motivation, try to find product fit, and then eventually start to scale from there, whether scaling um, different motivations, scaling internationally, scaling um, maybe from like different life cycles. Um, And there's two schools of thought. And so I use these paradigms, which is like, do I want to solve 
one person's problem or do I want to solve multiple people's problem? And so that's like a principle that I, I look at when you talk about customer motivation, which is, do you want to be very niche and solve like a very niche motivation or do you want to solve kind of a grouping um, or uh, a clustering of motivations? I think that's an important question to ask very early on in your strategy, uh, because if it's a singular motivation, then a lot of times what you you might end up doing is you might end up being very niche and then the size, the opportunity size for that product could be very limited. Now that doesn't, you know, you don't want to take my my word as like that that is the end all be all because there has been some definitely some very successful products that started off solving with just people who want to like you. <laughs> like if but like on your your college dorm uh, whiteboard and have turned into multi-billion dollar products. So definitely singular motivations do work. Uh, but you're hedging, right? You want to hedge on like how many motivations can you tap into? And the more motivations, especially when you have limited resourcing, I would say like, um, you know, where right now, you know, that I'd say there's um, limited resourcing that you are applied to products these days, you'll want to see, okay, what kind of leverage can I create um, across motivations? And so those are two different like product strategic thinking tools that a lot of times come after you've selected one motivation, then you realize you need to expand and then you start thinking about leverage. And what I would say is be more intentional about it and make that decision early on in your strategy around singular motivation or le creating leverage early on because it can lead to different outcomes. Yeah, I think the worst thing that can happen is to not make a decision and try to meet in the middle. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, or like you, um, a lot of times you'll see this where um, it, the companies are, they've had huge success with that singular motivation. And then they're trying, you can see them trying to like bridge it into another area. And it just, it doesn't work as well because you've had such huge success, like really gaining market share with that one problem set. So that's why I said there's like pros and cons. It's not a, a an exact silver bullet or answer for anyone. But what's important to your point is like be intentional about like understanding that dynamic. I want to take a tangent here because I think part of deciding what's your point of view and what you're going to build next uh, is influenced by, by the, the market and the competition. And uh, I know there are people will say, well, we are leaders. We don't look at anybody else because we are leaders. But the reality is that even if you're a leader, that doesn't mean that you have to invent absolutely everything. I mean, look at that um, example you gave about the college dorm that invented something, but they also didn't invent every single feature, right? Like they weren't the first ones to create the stories, for example. So as you think about competition, competitive intelligence, like how do you go about analyzing that, kind of taking what you like and, and also finding ways for you to, to create what, what doesn't exist yet? Yeah, uh, you know, there's, I'm a little more traditional there when you talk about market competition and looking at like market forces, um, looking at an ecosystem and the landscape. Um, but a, a simplistic like rule of how I approach this is like looking at time horizons. And so um, I try to like synthesize everything down to, to like the simplest principle because it's easier to teach product organizations like when you're a leader having to um, work with your product organization to, to pivot, to establish a new vision, um, to establish like a new roadmap. It's easier to pivot when it's simple. And so the principle here around competition is what are your time horizons? Like are the, the for market forces or competition, like is it relevant now or is it something that like gained market share 10 years ago as an example? And um, also like, are those competitors incremental or are they growth oriented? What's funny is a lot of companies will say like, we're innovative, we're growth oriented, I, you know, but then they're very incremental and I won't name who those are, but that, you know, it's interesting that like, if you were to listen to their uh, earnings call or read their 10 Ks, like you can see which ones have like really doubled down on like being constant growth um, driving companies and which ones are like more incremental. Well, competition, that's the type of intelligence you want to do due diligence on, which is like if you're going to go into a space where somebody's the dominant force in that space, 
what's your differentiator that's going to allow you to capture market share? And if you don't have a core differentiator that's going to allow you to capture that market share, then like what in the time horizon is giving you um, a competitive advantage? Like, for example, you know, is that company has been around a long time and it's time for like a fresh new um, narrative or take or approach to that problem? Or is it that, you know, literally it's a differentiating experience or feature, or perhaps it's a different targeted customer base. And so each of these things, um, whether you come in through differentiation, you come in through pricing wars, you come in through, uh, the, you know, some some approaches to competition is like the meat, the the sec, the, would it being number two, uh, like being a good or best in class number two, a, a lot of companies do that where they'll launch an experience or product as this number two and then gain market share that way. So it depends on um, what your strengths are as, as a product um, owner and as a company owner. Yeah, and, and I think at the end of the day, copying or keeping an eye on what's happening out there is smart because you can still choose not to copy because I think knowing what's happening can only make you more aware of the of the situation. And not every feature has to be copied to get a market advantage. Sometimes it's a defensive move, right? Like you might have some clients that will won't buy, or you might be losing clients just because you don't have a certain thing. So I, I like how you're thinking in terms of principles to, to just to, to know why you're making a decision to your point, and then so what? Absolutely. And, and can we talk about copying? Because I forgot to talk about this was something rooted in me early on that I learned from video games. So video games has this approach um, called teardowns. Basically, teardowns is a competitor research project that you dive deep into an experience and you understand the experience to figure out whether you want to copy it or not. And that's important. It's the only industry where I've seen it um, tailored in that way. Uh, whereas other companies just copy it, A-B test, see if the copy works, and like move on. Um, video games takes a very, like, I, I would say, academic approach to, like, copying. Um, so that I would say that's uh, something that might be of interest for some people, which is, like, really understand, like, what you're copying, why you're copying it. Is that copy of that experience actually even going to work in your product? Because the products might be different overall. And so just take li airlifting an experience into your your product may not work. Yeah, I mean, I'm just as you as you talk. I, I think about maybe Tinder. They create. They were one of the pioneers with this specific motion, right, to swipe like right or left. That has been applied to so many different products outside the online dating space. Or even there are patterns in e-commerce that now can be applied to SaaS or SaaS patterns that can be applied to uh, social networks. And, and I think as a PM, what's powerful is to really understand those patterns because there are certain mechanics that work for a reason and you don't want to reinvent the wheel there. However, you still want to build on top of that to add your differentiation. Absolutely. And I think it pairs well with my playground uh, paradigm where it's like, you know, there's experiences you can take from each of those industries that will be applicable. And I love that you said mechanic. That's very game oriented to me. Um, yeah, there's different mechanics that like some can be reapplied to new industries and new like products. And then there's some that like just flat out fail and like knowing the ones that can be applied and, and not like that's the core of the product thinking is like if you're going to copy something, a mechanic and put it into your experience and you're not sure why that mechanic works. Like that's where you're going to run into problems with that like new experience. And it's going to take you time to optimize it. And you're going to wonder why it's not working when it worked for Tinder, it should work for us. Like what's happening. And then companies, you know, three, four, <laughs> five years later, they finally get it right. And like, or they need to spend millions to acquire the competitor. to fix yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We know <laughs> these are stories. But... I want to wrap it up with a question about portfolio allocation, because as, as, as a leader and you look at your resources and your time horizon, like what's your, 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 your framework around allocating initiatives that might be short term, might, or might be mid term and even like moon, moon shots? Yeah, th this is um, served me well uh, throughout my journey. And I wouldn't say like every company is necessarily al aligned with this, but I try to find product areas that allow me to invest both on the optimization part of the portfolio as well as innovation. Um, and again, this may not apply, but I personally like if, if I go into a role um, and I find that innovation is not 
as um, encouraged as part of my portfolio allocation. Like that's where, uh, you know, kind of the type of leader that I am of challenging the status quo of like really pushing um, the envelope for like trying to break into new markets. I just think that's a good, healthy balance to have like 20% of your portfolio be innovation. Um, because if you're looking at your time horizon and you're still um, constantly optimizing like previous products, uh, you, you leave yourself up to risk uh, from those competitors we talked about to come into your market and take market share. So I'd say 20% innovation, zero to one um, type opportunities, new experiences, like they all fall in that category. Then the rest of that 80% you can break into, um, you know, part being optimizations, like what are the products that you have some market fit on and that you need to continue further on those roadmaps to like address needs that your your, your customers um, have and your users have. And then there's this um, 40%, roughly speaking, you know, this is kind of a, like a rule of thumb, which is really around like leverage. Remember I talked about that leverage um, which is like, what can you leverage from, you know, where you found product market fit and try to expand in new areas, which is very different from like the zero to one or the complete opposite, like new experience. That's not really um, something that's part of your core uh, strength. And so I, I think a lot of times, in my opinion, like companies tend to like allocate to the innovation or the optimization buckets. Um, and very rarely do you hear the storytelling around like the leverage bucket, which is like the things that are um, not major swings, but they're they're good enough swings. Well, thank you, Laura. It's been a, a pleasure to spend this time with you. And every time we interact, I know you've been a big time contributor to the product school community as a speaker now on the, on the podcast. Uh, obviously, some of the executive leaders that we do any, anyway, it's, it's awesome to pick your brain and, and keep learning together. Thank you for your time. Oh, absolutely. It's an honor to serve the product community. Um, and, and I appreciate all the work that you've done, uh, Carlos, with the community, with the company and everything else. And, and so thank you so much for inviting me today.